Mountain Movers Church is the most welcoming church I've ever been to. When we first pulled up, first time we came here, we seen everybody outside waving and we just felt at home. It was awesome, it was the greatest feeling ever. I really enjoy it and I think that it's life-changing when you come in. It's something that's super powerful to me. First time that I've really felt like I can connect with Jesus. I feel like it's not just going through the motions, that it's a true relationship with God and Jesus Christ that makes a world of a difference. Our mission is to lead people, lead people into a real life changing relationship with Jesus. That is confusing. Good morning, Mountain Movers. We're so glad that you've chosen to tune in with us this morning. If you like a challenge, we have a challenge for you today. If you know of anyone who doesn't have an online church family, make sure to take a second and share this experience. If you're on Facebook, make sure to hit share and host your own watch party so that all your Facebook friends will be notified that it's time to do church together. If you're also watching on our other online platforms, make sure to share the link to a friend and let's see if we can get 100 shares on this video. It's important to stay connected with each other, especially during these crazy times that we're living in. And a good way to do that is by joining a life group. Life groups are a perfect opportunity to connect with others while building a better relationship with them and strengthening and deepening your relationship with Christ. Right now, life groups are offered online only through a virtual platform called Zoom. This is a great way of being able to stay connected with each other despite not being able to physically be with each other. If you'd like to sign up for a life group today, visit our website at www.mountainmoverschurch.org slash groups. You guys are really important to us, so we want to know who's watching and where you guys are watching from. Comment in the section below on whatever platform you're watching from. If you see somebody you know, comment. Say, what's up? If you have any kids or know anyone who does, make sure to tune in at 11 a.m. for a life-changing kids experience for the whole family. In just a moment, we're going to invite the presence of God into our lives from wherever we're tuning in from. Get ready for a power-packed message as pastors Brad and Misty kick off our Easter series, Rescue Story, in part one of Help is on the Way. This morning we're going to bring a new worship song to you called This is a Move. So at this time, I want to encourage you, wherever you're watching from, just invite God's presence where you're at. Just say, God, come and fill this place and just surround me with your presence because when he shows up, Things begin to happen. He begins to move mountains in our lives. This song is such a beautiful declaration of saying, God, come and show up. We believe that you are going to move in our midst today. So in your own way, just begin to worship him. Just begin to call out to God and ask him to meet you right where you are. Let's pray this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you so much. God, there's so many families this morning, God, individuals that are watching in many different places. Wherever they're watching from this, this morning, today, this evening, whatever time they're watching, Father God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would just surround them right now with your presence. We pray that you would move in a mighty way. We're praying, God, that miracles, as you would show up, God, that miracles would begin to happen, that healing would begin to happen. We're praying, Father God, that you would move in a mighty, mighty way. We love you. We worship you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being moved. God, we believe it. Yes, we can see it. Wonders are still what you do.
the words we're about to sing good good father think about the words that you're going to see he is a good good father and he has such an incredible love for you Tender whisper. 
sing, you're a good, good father. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. I'm a love by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Father God, we thank you so much just for who you are. God, we thank you that you are a good, good father and that you love us regardless, regardless of our situations and our circumstances. God, you are who you say you are, yesterday, today, and forever. And we praise your name because of that. Jesus, I pray as, as we enter this Easter season, God, that we remember it's all about you. It's not about any of the rest of it. It's not about the bunny or the Easter eggs, God. It is about you and what you did because of your love for us. Jesus, we thank you. We praise you this morning. It is in your holy name we pray. Amen. Hey, Mountain Movers Church. In just a moment, Misty and I are going to bring you an incredibly encouraging message that is going to add so much hope to your life. But before we do, I want to give you an opportunity to make a really big difference in someone else's life. How can you do that from wherever you're watching from right now with your giving? With church being 100% online, we have a wide open opportunity to take the mountain moving message of Jesus Christ to the world. People are hurting so much right now. They're scared and in need of God's peace and his provision. But thankfully, because of you that have remained faithful in the tithe and offerings, we haven't skipped a beat with our reach. We are reaching more families now than ever before and our church family is staying connected and encouraged. You know, recently we saw five people that gave their lives to Christ while watching online. Did you hear what I said? Five people will spend eternity in heaven because of your giving. With life groups being online, our church family is able to encourage one another, pray for each other during this time, all while growing in our relationship with God. Our, our church is staying connected and stronger more than ever because of your giving. Thank God for technology and our rock star staff for making it happen, but it was your giving that made it possible. So here's what I want you to do. Trust God today with your giving. God asks all believers to return the first tenth of our income back to him as a sign of surrender and commitment to his kingdom. When you do this, you put yourself in a position for God's provision while changing the lives of others. You see, God doesn't need your money. He owns it all. However, he knew that in order for his church to operate and reach the masses with the message of heaven's hope, it would take people like you giving your very best financially. So what are you waiting for? Give today and change someone else's tomorrow. There's three easy ways to give. You can text MMC to 77977. You can go to mountainmoverschurch.org and click give. Or you can mail your giving to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. Now let's pray today. I want to pray over you and over your home that God would bless your gift and bless your giving. Father, we love you so much, and I thank you, God, for every person that is watching uh, today online. I pray, God, that you would show them the truth of your word, Father God, that you will provide for and bless those who return the tithe to you. You'll bless those that give their offerings, their gifts above their tithe to you, Father God. I pray, Lord, with this giving that you would multiply it, that you would bless it, that many, many, many people uh, would be touched and encouraged, God, because of today's givers and their giving. I pray blessings of health and healing. I pray blessings of finances, God, and families today, God, that every life would be touched that is watching today. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A story that would change the world and split history in two. The creator wore mortality. Clothed in human form, 
born into the lowest place, lived a blameless life and became our sacrifice. Sent to the cross to be silenced forever. His ways were offensive to the powerful people around him. His teachings, his love, his values were an affront, a threat to the schemes and plans of men. A teacher who said, your greed is true death. Your desire for power and control deceives you and leaves you hollow. That grace and love is the only way to lay down one's life for another. To rescue those in need is the only truth that will stay. On that cross he lay with his last breath. It is finished, he said. But on the third day he will be raised to life again because love is here to stay. Death could not hold him. The grave could not overcome him. Evil cannot contain him. The cross cannot beat him. Fear will not end him. Greed will not silence him. He is our hope. He is our redemption. His grace outshines our guilt. He is the one who forgives all our sins. He is our fulfillment. He justifies us. He is our healer and our ever-present hope. He is our Father, our King, the Lord of Lords, and His love is invincible. He is Jesus. It's an iconic classic. We love teaching the Every Easter year. story. And we've honestly kind of shrunk it into just a couple weeks because of the, the virus that's going around and we were preaching on fear. So today we're super excited. We're starting part one of Rescue Story. But let me tell you what we're going to do that's kind of different. We've never done this before. So we are going to actually bring eight messages to you over crazy. the next eight days. So today it's is like, going to be like part one. Old time camp meeting revivals, like eight days of preaching, nonstop. Nonstop. Straight, We've never done it. But what never we're going to do is, it's very cool. Today is actually known as Palm Sunday. You probably know that it's on your calendar. We're going to talk about it today. But this is actually the beginning of the Passion Week. So every day this week, Jesus did something, and it was it was leading up to the cross. And so each day, we're going to bring you a micro mini micro message micro mini message okay so Six it's not gonna micros, be it's not gonna be a big message two macros that's right all right little bitty and then next sunday we're gonna wrap it up on easter now let me tell you we're gonna do something very cool on easter so easter morning we just can't stand not seeing your faces like honestly i know you can see us but i can't see you I'm and i'm kind of freaking out going a little into bit a depression Seriously. i'm in mmc people Mountain Movers withdrawals. I need to see you. Need to see you. So Easter morning, 11 a.m., we are going to do a drive-in Easter experience. Now, yes. what does that mean? It means you're going to drive in, you're going to park, we are going to be outside, we are going to be doing the across the creek, worship, prayer, communion. It's going to be awesome. You are going to stay distanced away from one another because you're going to stay in your car. So join us next week, 11 a.m., and then that evening at 6 o'clock, you'll be able to watch the actual live service that will also go out at 6 that night. That's so right. if you can't make it on campus, that's okay. But for those of you who are sick and tired of being stuck in your houses, you want to get out and see, at least see somebody's face and smile and wave, Join us next oh, week. It's going to be so much fun. Okay, so we're so today we're starting this new series that we have entitled Rescue Story. Now, I love, love, love a good rescue story, and I, I'm sure you do too. Now, I, I'm reminded of a, a, a real rescue story that took place in the late 90s, I think around 96. Happened to a guy by the name of Tony Bullimore, 
And he was this transatlantic yachtsman. He was world-renowned, and he was in this worldwide race uh, called the Vendy Globe Round the World Race. Can you believe it? How incredibly original. The, the keel came up over the top of 50-foot swells. This boat flipped over in the, in the race. It capsized, and he was trapped in the hull of the boat. He was trapped in freezing temperatures for four days straight. Can you imagine being trapped in your boat in the water? He only had a few feet to breathe in for four days straight. As they interviewed him, they, they, uh, he, he claimed that he came to a point where he believed that there was absolutely no way out. He believed truly that he was going to die. And lo and behold, the Royal Australian Navy, along with the Air Force, they actually found him through satellite technology. They found his boat, and they began to develop this strategy, this plan to rescue him. So they, they, they strategized this entire rescue mission, and eventually they got to him. And as they pulled him up out of the water and they got him harnessed in, in the, um, the, what do you call it, the... The, the gurney? Gurney, yes, the gurney. Yes. They strapped him in, and they've got his head in place, and you can just see him just thanking God, and he is saying, this is like, this is heaven. What, just coming out of the water, seeing that there's, there's res the rescue helpers, the, 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 the guys are here to save me. He said, this is just absolute heaven. It's got to be God. It's a miracle. He was so, as you can imagine, he was so incredibly grateful for these individuals that had come to rescue him. I think back, I'm, I'm an 80s kid, so I think back uh, to, it was 1987, baby Jessica. She was 18 months old. She was trapped in a well. I think for, probably the whole world The whole world watched. watched. If you were alive, you were watching that story of baby Jessica, which was 18 months old. 18 months I old. I mean, it just I can't imagine broke as a your dad. heart. If, you, if you, you don't know the story, you should look it up. It's on even on the History Channel. But we watched as they rescued this baby, and, they and she baby lived. And pulled baby Jessica up. Amazing. Uh, there's other stories of miners that have been trapped in caverns, and they, they survived after many, many days of being underground, and then eventually they were rescued. So we can, we can think of rescue stories that we all know of, and man, we, we love the excitement and the inspiration and just really the great feeling that there is when you realize that these people have been saved. Right. Just such an awesome, awesome um, celebration when, when somebody is rescued. So we are going to capture the greatest rescue story ever told over these next eight days. We are going to capture the story of how God strategically planned a rescue where he rescues humanity. It's the greatest rescue story of all time. It's God's plan. And it can be, it can be captured in this one scripture, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. It says this. It says, Jesus gave his life for our sins. Just as God our Father planned, he planned it. It's a rescue plan. It's a strategy in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. He had a plan all along. He did. And you know what? It was meticulous. Every single rescue that you hear about, the ones we've watched worldwide, the ones that we've celebrated when someone had a success story, every single rescue story starts with a problem. All right, I want you to think about this. It starts with a problem. The little girl fell in a well. Like, that was a huge problem. And so today, we're going to start off by talking about what was the problem that we needed to be rescued from. All right? So if you go all the way back to the beginning of your Bible, and we don't have time to take you through the whole thing, but if you go back to the beginning, you begin to see this story of Adam and Eve. You begin to see the story of God creating humanity. And as he does, he does it with one purpose in mind. We've talked about this for so many years because this really is what God was all about. He was about relationships. He wanted nothing more than to have a relationship with people, with humanity, with someone who would choose to love him for who he was. All right? He had the angels. They were created to worship, but he gave us something called free will. And that free will allows us to make that decision for ourselves. Will we choose to love God, have a relationship with God, or will we not? And so Adam and Eve, as we all know, they were set in this perfect scene, the Garden of Eden, and then they go and blow it. 
for all of us. I mean, they completely blow it. I'll never forget my son. Years and years ago, AJ was like four years old, and Brad told him to help him take out the trash. And he was like, why do we have to do work? Like, why do we have to do chores? And he's like stomping he's been all the way. He's been Malvin since he was two he's feet He's been tall. Malvin since he was this big. <laughs> so he's stomping all the way to the trash can, and he gets almost to the dumpsters, and he looks at his dad, and he says, you know what? When I get there in that judging line, I'm like, judging line? He's, he's four. When I get to heaven and I'm in that judging line and I see Adam, I'm going to punch him right in the mouth. And Brad was like, why are you going to do that? Because it's because he sinned that we have to work. work. Now, right. listen, for a four-year-old, he had, he had it down pretty well. But the fact is, when Adam and Eve chose to break the boundary line that God had set up for them, sin entered the world. Romans 5 and 12 says it this way. When Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. Adam's sin brought forth death. Don't take my illustration. Come on, I'm, ready. Off. I'm ready. This is so Adam's good. sin brought forth death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone had sinned. And I just want to show you very clearly you when have Adam to do the sinned, illustrations. You don't I ever love let illustrations. Me have any fun, when ever. Adam sinned, it's just like this. Just one little sin infiltrates, just like a contagious disease, the entire human race. This was the problem. We were now all contaminated, and the Bible makes it very clear that there was a debt to be paid for sin, because sin would literally separate us. It would bring a separation in our relationship from God. So God starts this rescue mission, and the Bible actually says that before the foundations of the world were even set, that he knew that humanity would blow it. He knew that we would mess it up, that we would pass the boundary line, that we would bring sin into the world, and so he had set a plan in motion from the beginning. You see, sin, literally what it is, it's a legal problem, because God established this standard by which we live called the law, all right? And so when you break the law, we all know there's a penalty or a consequence or a wage or a debt that has to be paid when you break the law, right? Has anybody ever got a ticket? Oh, don't raise your hand. That's embarrassing, right? No, we have. And when we get a ticket, there are penalties that have to be paid, right? There is a debt. And, you know, we talk so often about how Jesus came as the rescue mission. He came to bring about forgiveness. And I just want to tell you what that word literally means. It means to cancel a debt. So as we roll into this rescue story, realize this. There's not one of us that don't have our lives contaminated with sin because sin infected the entire human race. And the only way that we can come back into a relationship with God is through forgiveness, is through the debt being paid. So we're going to look this morning at the second part of this, and that is the actual rescue plan that God set into motion. And I just want to say, if, if, if you have planned on not taking notes, you have made a huge mistake. Seriously. Because over the next eight days, we are going to just fire hose, pressure wash you with the details of this story. And I just want to tell you that there's a lot of people that have grown up in church right. and they, they grew up the entire time in church not knowing the things that we are going to teach you in the Word of God. We are going to help connect the dots from the very beginning from Adam and Eve all the way to the resurrection. So this is going to be so informative. It's going to be really, really good stuff. But if you understand it and you comprehend the plan of what God has done, it will absolutely change your life. Greatest rescue story of all time. So the next thing that God did is he said, I need to step in and I need to create a sacrificial system that was temporary for the atonement of humanity's sins. So you can see this take place uh, in Hebrews 9 and 22. It says, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. Say blood. blood. 
It was all about the blood. It was all because this is this. It's the bloodline of humanity was contaminated with sin. We couldn't get it out. When something gets in your bloodstream, it's really hard to get it out once it's in there. And so that's what happened. Sin contaminated the bloodline of humanity. So God says, we're going to have to do something about this. So he steps in and, and literally performs the first animal sacrifice, which you're thinking, oh, my gosh, that is horrible. That is cruel that is brutal, but God didn't want it that way. We're the ones who made it have to roll out that way because of our sins. God had to use an innocent animal to die in our place so that we could have temporary forgiveness of our sins. Then God takes another step, and he does, what He does is He chooses a bloodline through which His Son Jesus could be born. So he picks, and this is point two right here. If you're following along, I'm not really good at giving you points. Point one was God institutes a sacrificial system that's temporary for covering sin. Point two is God chose a bloodline through which his son Jesus could be born. So he gets this guy named Abraham. You ever heard of Abraham? All right, I'm not going to sing the song because we don't have time, but Abraham is the guy that God picked, and he said, I'm going to use you and I'm going to be glorified through your bloodline. I'm going to give you as many children as you see the stars in heaven. So, he, so, he be, so Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob, God, Jacob wrestles with God, if you've heard that story. And, and God changes his name. This is one of these missing links. If you grew up in church, you may have never understood this. God changes Jacob's name to Israel. And now that's where we get the term as he begins to have children. And they have children, and they have children. This becomes a huge family that turns into millions of people, and they are called the children of Israel. Israel and which that's the entire Old Testament is all about all this about this family, the people. family. Now it's a people. Now it's a nation. It, well, it is after they come out of Egypt, but this is like a family group that God establishes in as a nation, and the whole Old Testament is about them, the children of Israel. So the land that we know of as Israel today are the, the children of Israel or Jacob. All right, goes all the way back to Abraham. So this is the bloodline that God picks in order to bring Jesus through this bloodline and bring ultimate forgiveness of sin. In Exodus 6, 5 through 6, check this out. This is what God says. He says, I've also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. At this time in history, the children of Israel were in slavery in Egypt, all right? Some of these, we're telling you all these Bible stories, we're putting them together, and I hope that it's creating this timeline that you can grab onto. And I have remembered my covenant, my promise with them. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from all of the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched hand with great judgments. Hence the word rescue. I will rescue you. You know, God's been in the business of rescuing for a really, really long time, and he's still in the business of rescuing. Point number four. God sends his one and only son to be the perfect, sinless sacrifice. So now we pick up at the Christmas story where Jesus is born in a manger in Bethlehem, this baby Jesus that is actually 100% God, 100% baby all at the same time. He grows up, becomes about Scholars think about 30 years old, and he begins his public ministry. He goes on, and with the power of Almighty God, he's performing miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, and he's healing the blind and raising the, the dead to life and all these crazy, uh, you know, lame people that can't walk, and he's telling them to get up and walk and take their mats, and, and they're healed. It's crazy, crazy stuff. So, so God begins this public ministry for three years through Jesus. And then all of a sudden, here we are, and this is, this is day one of the Passion Week or of the rescue story. This is the story where he comes in, and we begin, it's the beginning of the end. We're going to begin the last week before Jesus came up out of the tomb, was resurrected, and overcame death, hell, and the grave for the next uh, seven days, if you will, we're telling the story starting on day one. So here we go. We're in Matthew 21, 1 through 11. You can read this story. This is called the triumphal entry. Jesus is rolling into town, 
And he tells his disciples as he's making his way into town, he says, go and get me a donkey. And this is the fulfillment of prophecy, which can be found in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. You see, everybody knew, the Jews, everybody knew that there was a prophecy that was told a long time ago that the, there was going to be a king that was going to rescue, say rescue. rescue. He was going to rescue Israel, and they were expecting him to come. But hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years had gone by where they were expecting this king to come. And so here's Jesus performing all these crazy miracles. And then he asks his boys to go get a donkey. And so when they see him riding in on the donkey, they realize, man, this is it. This is him. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy. Let me read Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout! O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation or rescue, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is a beautiful picture that Jesus is ushering in the kingdom that had been prophesied many, many years ago, all right? But here's what's really interesting is they begin, they, he rolls into town, and he's on the donkey, and the crowds begin to see him. The crowds go nuts. They are screaming, and they're, they're, they're shouting out, and they say this, and this is, this is found uh, here in, this is Matthew 21, and I, I believe verse 9. It says, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Here's what's really, really interesting about this, okay? Is Jesus in, in Hebrew means he shall save. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that down. The, na the definition of Jesus in Hebrew means he shall save save. It's a future tense. This is a person that is going to rescue us. He shall rescue us. But when they were saying Hosanna, what they were saying is Hosanna in the Hebrew means rescue us now. Rescue us right now. We don't want this in the future. We want it now. What an interesting picture of really where the children of Israel were in their heart, in their mind, in their perspective of who Jesus was and who they wanted him to be. You know, I don't know if you think about this when you hear the story of the triumphal entry when Jesus rides this donkey into Jerusalem, but I've always wondered about this until I really begin to understand, and that is, where did this huge crowd of people come from? Like, why was there a parade happening on that day? Why were there all these people lining the streets of Jerusalem when Jesus just rides in on this un, like, un, what am I trying to say? It, it Green, wasn't it tamed. Wasn't even it was broke. Yeah, it wasn't even broke. This donkey that wild. he just rides in for the first time. Well, let me back up and kind of help you understand why these people were there in Jerusalem. You see, this was actually a national holiday. This was Passover. And Passover was something that had been instituted when they were back in Egypt, when God was delivering them out of the land of Egypt. He was taking them from slavery of 400 years and bringing them to the promised land. And the last night before they left, on the day that he did the 10th plague in Egypt, he literally says, hey, I'm going to bring a death angel in. And I'm going to kill every firstborn of their homes and their animals if there's not blood covenant over the door. Literally, he said, go out, take a pure, spotless little lamb. This is sad, but again, blood covers the sin. Sacrifice the lamb, take hyssop, dip it in it like a paintbrush, and paint it over the top of your doorpost. And when the death angel comes in, whoever's home has this blood covenant over the top, the death angel will pass over them. All right, so that night, God literally sends the death angel in. Everyone in Egypt has someone that dies in their home, and they literally are like, get out of our land. And God rescues the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So then every year after that, God told them to set up a holy day, a holiday to remember that moment. And that holiday is called 
Passover. And so every year since then, they had been doing this thing called Passover, and there was a lot of rituals that went with it. But at this time in the New Testament, this is actually the Passover celebration. Everybody had to come to the land of Jerusalem. It was the capital city. So everybody comes to the capital city, and at that time, they would choose one lamb for the entire nation of Israel. And what they would literally do is they would bring this little lamb down the city streets, and everybody would gather on either side of the streets, theologians believe, and they would cheer as the little lamb came through the streets, and they would literally say, this is the lamb that would take away our sin. Remember, this is temporary because this is an animal. But for that next year, this is the lamb that takes away our sin. It brought our rescue, our salvation, if you will. All right, so understand and follow me. This huge parade is happening because it's a holiday. Everybody is there watching. Theologians believe that the high priest has just come through with the lamb. They've gone down the street, and now all of a sudden, everybody looks back, and I can only imagine, here comes Jesus, superstar riding on the colt of a donkey, coming through the crowd. And as Brad said, they begin to realize, oh, my gosh, this is it. It's happening. Like, this is the prophecy. This is the Messiah. This is the one who's going to overthrow the Roman government. This is the one right now that's going to bring peace to this nation. No more persecution. So they literally grab branches from off the trees, and they start waving the palm branches as he goes by. But here's what's interesting about that very fact. See, John the Baptist said in John 12 and 9, he said, This is Jesus, the Passover lamb, who came to the river to be baptized. Look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, when Jesus rode in, what he was saying is, I am the lamb. He came in right behind the actual lamb, and he was declaring, I am the Passover lamb who's about to be sacrificed. A really cool thing before we move on past this point, is that God had told them specifically on the 10th day of the first month, which was Nisan, they were to choose a pure spotless lamb. And it was that day on the 10th that they were bringing this little lamb down the street. And it was on the 14th day of Nisan that they were to literally slit the throat. I don't know what else to say. They had to sacrifice the lamb. And they would cook that lamb, and they would eat it for the Passover meal on the 14th. So literally, they would take this lamb, they would go stake the lamb at the temple where everybody could come and examine to make sure that this lamb chosen by the high priest was sufficient. It was pure. It was spotless for the whole nation. And on the 14th, which is Friday, the same day Jesus gives his life, is the same day the sacrificial lamb at the temple also loses his life. Don't miss out on Friday's micro-message, mini-message. you got to hear it. We're going to tie it all together. But you see, that day was so important because Jesus was identifying himself as the Passover lamb. It's really important to understand in this story, especially as we make our way into the triumphal entry, that the people of Israel, the Passover crowds, they really, truly, even with the prophecy, they didn't understand who Jesus really was. At least in their mind, you know, you have to, you have to realize that they were living under this tyrannical control of Rome, okay? That the, the, the empire of Rome, and, and they were controlling them, they were taxing them, there was massive oppression. The Israelites were absolutely miserable. They didn't want to live under these conditions. And so based on the prophecy, they were expecting that their king was going to come in a way that he would overthrow the Roman Empire because the prophecy talked about how they would experience this freedom, this 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 rescue, if you will. So they're they're expecting him to come in and they're like, okay, he's not on a he's not on a war horse. That's okay, because we've seen other kings come in on donkeys before. See, King David, anytime he was making his way to or from one town to the next, if he was on his way to war, he would come in on a steed. But if he was just making his way from town to town and there was a season of peace that they were in, he would ride a donkey. 
when King Solomon, David's son, was inaugurated as king, he came through Jerusalem, just like Jesus did, on his way to the temple, just like Jesus was on his way to the temple, and he rode in on a donkey, which symbolized the donkey as an animal itself symbolizes being lowly, being humble. But understand this, it doesn't mean weak. We're not talking about weakness. We're talking about meekness, which is incredible power under perfect control. Jesus, being God and King, was expressing supernatural power, the supernatural power of God under perfect control. He's rolling in. He's showing them that He is King. And they're right by singing their praises, but they're expecting this King to operate to rescue them differently. This is what I want you to get as we're closing up today. I want you to understand that many, many times God doesn't rescue us or answer our prayers or respond to our expectations the way we expect Him to. The Israelites, the Jews, were expecting Jesus to use the same power that He had used to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to cast out demons. They were expecting him to use this godly power to overthrow the government, the tyrannical powers of Rome. And Jesus did come to free them. Jesus did come to rescue them, but he didn't come to do it in the way that they had expected. He had a different strategy for his rescue plan. Jesus had different motives about freeing his people and bringing rescue. You know, there's so many times, I just want to take a side note here. This is a great teachable moment. There's so many times when you expect God to do something in a certain way. You're you're, you're asking, and you even pray specifically, Lord, give me, give me this this job, Lord, that I've applied for. I've, I've sent in my resume, and I'm just praying in the name of Jesus, and I'm pleading the blood, and I'm quoting every scripture I know, and I'm just believing because this job is going to pay way more than any other job I've ever had, and it's going to put us in the perfect school district, and we're going to be able to move to a bigger house, and you start lining things up in your mind, and you're like, if, if this would only work out the way I want it to, God, if you could just do this the way I want you to do this, but so oftentimes, there's these unanswered prayers, and you're telling yourself that God didn't answer. When God did answer, the answer was no, because God knows better than you do. That's why He's God, and you're not. God, he's never ceased to amaze me. So many times, I think even with the way this church got off the ground, I thought that this church would get off the ground differently. I thought we would plant in a different place than where we did. I thought we'd actually have money when we planted it. I thought we'd have people. I I thought that things would roll out a lot quicker than the way they did. But, you know, God wanted to teach us. He wanted to groom us. He wanted to teach us how to be leaders before we were given people to lead. So he just gave us a few families at a time so we could make most of our mistakes there in the beginning and get it over with. See, if God would have answered our prayer and given us all the money and all the people, we wouldn't have been the people that he needed us to be, to be the leaders that he had called us to be. So you have to understand God doesn't always move in the way you expect him to. It's like the old Garth Brooks song. I love it, man. I wore out that tape in junior high. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. It's so true. It's so true. You have to learn to thank God for those prayers that he doesn't answer. When's the last time you did that? When's the last time you said, God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that it didn't work out in that relationship. Thank you, God, because you know what? He wasn't right for you. He he was going to mistreat you. Maybe he was going to abuse you. You don't know what God is up to. But God knows better than you do. And just because you don't see God working doesn't mean that God isn't at work. It means he's doing something behind the scenes. He's doing something that you can't see. But you have to learn to just trust him. So Jesus comes rolling in. And they believe that he's going to overthrow Rome. But that's not. That's not the way this is going to go down. That's not the way his rescue plan worked out. It says in Matthew 21. Verse 10 and 11, I love this passage here at the end. It says in verse 10, as he made his entrance into Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken. Say shaken. 
The whole city was shaken. It means that they were in an uproar. They were unnerved. They were, they were, they were just rattled because there was this big commotion. They didn't understand. The crowd didn't understand what was going on. And, and, and people just began asking this question. This is so powerful. What's going on here? Followed by, who is this? Who's, who's this? Who's coming through town and, and with, that's causing and creating all of this ruckus and all of this shifting and all of this commotion? What's going on? Who is this? And the parade crowd, the Passover crowd, they answered and they said, this is the prophet Jesus. If you remember, what does Jesus mean? Jesus means he shall rescue. So by answering their question, this is Jesus. This is he who is about to rescue you. It's a prophetic truth, a declaration about who Jesus is and what he had come to do. This is Jesus. He's about to rescue you. As we close today, and man, the next seven days are going to be absolutely incredible. So you got to watch every day as we begin to just unravel this story of rescue. But I want to ask you a question. Do you know who Jesus is? Now, now you, you may have grown up in church your entire life and not really know who Jesus is. Because what did you say it was about? Relationship. It's about relationship. He wants to know you. He wants to know you. And so today, um, I, I, I want... I want you to just picture yourself being in the water, in the deep, and you see this life ring. This life ring, it saves. <laughs> but you might, be, you might be treading in the water right now, and you might just, you might think you're okay. You might, you might think that everything is good because you got this and you're a good swimmer. But you can only tread for so long. You can only swim in the water for so long without being able to touch the bottom and give your feet rest before you're going to get really, really tired and then eventually you're going to get weak. Right now, you might be okay, but eventually there's going to come a time when you need Jesus, He who shall rescue. And I just want to ask you, have you come to that point where you've called on Him? Jesus is the life ring. He's the life saver or the life savior, if you will. And today, we're, we're, and throughout this series, we're just going to throw that ring out to you, Right? We're going to throw that ring out to you, and we're just going to ask you continually through this series, have you, have you grabbed onto that ring? A lot of people, they, they believe that Jesus uh, is God, and they say, I love God, and they, they say, I pray to God, and I believe he exists, but they don't have relationship with him. You can be treading in the water and believe that the life ring, hear me, you can believe that the life ring has the ability to save you. You can believe that the life ring, that it floats and that it exists that it's real, you can believe the life ring is real, but if you don't grab hold of it, you're never going to be saved. You're never going to be saved. You've got to cling to Jesus with everything you have, everything you are. You've got to hold on to Jesus for dear life until heaven is your home. Every single day, my relationship with God is about holding on, about clinging to Him, because His Word says, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, you're, you're so tired of treading, come to me, cling to me, and I will give you rest. So are you tired? Maybe you are a believer, but you've just been You've just been trying to do things on your own. I think a lot of times we, we default to doing things on our own. And we kind of push God out of the equation and we only call on Him when we need Him. When we need Him to intervene in our circumstances or in our situation. Cling to Him. Reach out. Grab hold. Grab hold of Him and hold on with everything that you are. And He'll help you. He'll give you hope. He'll give you a future. I want to pray today. I want to pray over you and your family. Let's bow today and, and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray over each and every individual watching. I pray, Lord, that they would recognize that you are the one who has rescued us. 
pray, God, that, that, that people that are watching would just feel compelled to just as they're treading and maybe they're tired. Maybe they're tired of doing things on their own and they've just kind of pushed you away. They believe you exist. They know you're real. But they've just tried to do it on their own and they've left you out of the picture. I pray, God, that they would just reach out to you, the life ring, and just hold on and cling to you. Cling to the ring. That you would give them rest. You would rescue with heads bowed and eyes closed today, I, I, I pray for those of you that would, you'd say, I don't have relationship like Misty was talking about. I need relationship with Jesus. It's as easy as admitting that you have sinned and believing that Jesus is the Son of God and confessing that He is Lord of your life. Will you do that today with heads bowed, eyes closed? Will you just call out to Jesus? If you're watching online today, if you're, if you're watching online, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Father, I love you. Forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I confess him as Lord of my life. Rescue me today as I hold on to you. In Jesus' name.